let's continue here on this interesting discussion. We had one question here, a general question, and then we have a question in the front. Doug, Aaron, next, and then you're quite, we can get to you, Madam, in, in the front here. So we'll start here, then Doug, and then you. Go ahead. Um, I, think I, I think I'd like to start by uh, congratulating the modelers and uh, congratulating uh, WIDER for working on this uh, very urgent topic um, where I think it's uh, really useful for many people um, to be able to refer to, to these detailed studies and analyses. Um, in, a, in a context where, um, you know, the, the urgency um, is underlined by the fact that um, there are regular meetings. There were two last week, one in Bangkok and one in San Francisco, uh, discussing what the hell we're going to do about this problem. Um, there's also another set of models called Earth System Models, recently published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. Very pessimistic. Uh, well, that depends. If you want the temperature of the planet to increase significantly, then that's fine. <laughs> They're not pessimistic. Um, leaving Saudi Arabia aside for the moment, um, that's a way economists like to assume that Saudi Arabia um, doesn't do anything, uh, doesn't change its production uh, function or whatever. The, pre the ev evidence that you've presented here, and particularly the Indian emissions scenario, suggests that for the Southern Africans, they're going to be stuck in the unconstrained emissions. The Indian NDC scenario, as far as I could see from your slide, indicates that by 2050, India is going to be emitting a lot more than 6% of global greenhouse gas emissions. I think your thermal, uh, the, the thermal section of your diagram uh, showed that there's going to be some attempt to limit expansion of coal production, but it's not going to be significant. Um, you referred, uh, Channing, to the um, interest in Mozambique in expanding its coal exports. Um, that's another, <laughs> another um, unknown in the equation. So my question really is, I mean, the scenarios that you've, that you've put forward for low emissions aren't they actually hopelessly unrealistic given the, given the trends in, in, in emissions that are actually being tabled in international negotiations? The Indian scenario, the Indian emissions are what the Indian government formally puts forward in an international negotiation as what the Indians are intending to do. We have a problem. I'm glad I don't, don't live in Southern Africa and I don't depend on on, on, uh, on hydropower, but you know, um, the emissions scenario that you presented suggests that the modeling that you're doing in Southern Africa, um, well, it's not, doesn't look very good. Could you comment on that <laughs> from the panel's point of view? <laughs> okay, so we will do that. Let's go to Doug and then in front, and then we'll let all three comment. Doug? Yeah, Doug Arendt, NREL. Um, thank you. Um, very, very nice uh, presentations. I'd like to reflect or maybe ask you to reflect a little bit relative to the, the Stieglitz uh, talk this morning on different development pathways and this multi-prong approach that, that he proposed. Uh, and also bring into it much more strongly the, the climate environmental sustainability aspect, which was the question I had asked him. And let me build off the prior question and ask it in a little bit more different way, which is, so one is to reflect on that, but the second one is, given the probability that the world is not on a tightly mitigating trajectory, which we know from the initial NDCs and the analysis thereof, with the intent that they would do a stock take and raise their ambitions in the next few years. What, would, what do we need to do collectively as, I'll call it, environmental and development economists to raise the confidence that those countries should take much, much stronger 
local ambition and action, as well as continue to engage in the international dialogue around the global commons, which is not or does not seem to be the primary driver right now, but it's really about the effect of that global failure on local development and local economies. Thanks. Thank you. If you could pass the microphone in front, or last question, then we'll ask the three Even panelists. More? <laughs> one more, last one here. <laughs> So about the floods, I would like to ask you whether in Africa also floods bring the siltation to the fields and it's very beneficial for food production also. If the dam then controls the floods and then there's a torrential rain or a storm and it becomes flash flood and people have already kind of been used to that there's no flood and they have been building and living in the in the region and when the flash flood comes it kills people it's not not any kind of kind of uh, externalist but it really kills people and uh, is this happening there and how you are going to kind of work on that in this issue it's it's true that I mean even even if CCC in their uh, site have shown that if all countries just follow their NDCs, we are not going to be somewhere near two degrees also, right? So that's already there. So it's true that ambition needs to be raised by each country if we really want a stabilization scenario. Um, the kind of uh, research we are doing in India, say from my institutional point of view, what we are trying to do is that we are trying to present these to the government and say that you have more potential to take on the ambition, higher ambition. So this is one kind of negotiation you can see that what the researchers are trying to do. I'll just give a very small example. Uh, it was in 2000 when India used to go to different international negotiation and we were in part of the consultative committee of the government, right? So they used to invite us sometimes to discuss. So in one of the meetings, before they were going to one of the Bonn conferences in 2002 or so, so they said that, oh my God, we are going to the meeting again and we have nothing to show and the international community will be pressuring on us exactly this language, right? That, so what do we do? So then we said, actually our studies show that there are energy efficiency improvement which are happening in the industries. So why don't you show that these things are happening and you can see that how you can build on this later. Actually, I would say there were many of us and so when we all produced our results and they saw those, they actually used those in the international negotiation and showed that this is what is happening so we can commit something. So earlier government actually committed uh, that how much energy efficiency reduction they're going to do. So these are, I think, these help the government. to. So research community really need to come up with the solutions, what we are seeing and how they can increase their ambition. So I would think that that needs to be the approach. And we also need to come up with different thoughts that how the coal can be replaced. So of course there are now supercritical coal is coming, but which I think that there are different ways how you can do. So I think the research community really need to feed in more and more and give confidence that what the countries can do. And uh, there lies our role. So that's one thing which I just think and um, so what is the other? So, yeah. Um, yeah, so one more. Yeah, that's what I wanted to say, right? Okay. I, I'm more optimistic now certainly than I was five years ago uh, or, or, or seven. There's really a lot that, that's been happening uh, over, the, over the past few years. Um, you know, one of the graphs that I like to show is, is you know, global emissions have been flat for, for three years, 14, 15, and 16. There's been no growth at all. 9% uh, growth in global GDP and zero growth in, in global emissions and from all of the major sources. 
And this is, you know, uh, as a result of what Doug uh, was presenting yesterday and FICA and, and others, um, big, well, and, and Joy Ashery in terms of there's, there's efficiency gains, and then, then there's been big, big changes in the way that we, we generate new power uh, with a lot of it coming from, from, from wind and solar. Uh, this, these are no longer, th this, you know, total investment in wind and solar far outstrips, far outstrips investment in coal, nuclear, and, and natural gas, it's like a factor of two. Uh, and, and so these, the, there's, these things are, are happening, uh, and, and so there's, there's a pacing that's actually going on. We'll get from uh, Edgar the 2017 global emissions from, from fossil fuels. So it's not the, not the, not the full uh, thing. Um, and, and we'll see, we expect to see uh, you know, a slight increase in emissions, you know, I don't know, maybe 1% or something like that. But nevertheless, you're going to look at a period, four-year period, where the global economy has grown by more than 10%, somewhere around 12, and, uh, and emissions have grown by, by one, and that's never happened. Uh, and you, you got you to plateau bef before, you, before you decline, right? And so we're starting to see um, th these, these investments uh, 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 starting uh, uh, to, to kick in. So uh, I think that, that there is a, uh, there, there's, there's quite a bit that's going on uh, if you look, and a lot of it happening just recently. I think the South Africa case that, that Faika mentioned is, is uh, talked about yesterday is, is, is illuminating, and I was involved in it. You know? Eight years ago, it was coal as far as the eye could see, and we talked about, oh, here's what you have to give up in order to, to reduce your, your emissions. And, uh, and then we've been working, and, and we, we, South Africa is very well endowed with sun, it's very well endowed with wind, uh, and it's had done quite a bit uh, of analysis. And over the past three years, um, we, we've come around where, where basically there's a, a recognition that, that wind and solar are you know, going in basically no more building of, of solar power of coal-fired power plants uh, and and the retiring of each one as it as it ends the uh, its useful life is the optimal uh, sort of the least cost uh, uh, path and uh, and and, uh, uh, and and then and then you know so instead of arguing that you know we need this in order to grow you know the, the arguments are now oh well we can't afford to leave coal because uh, of the social impacts in coal producing regions and we're going to lose all these mining employment and and so on and so forth so i think you know th that's a research agenda i think that's a very similar agenda in in india uh, part of the good news is that you know where we need uh, the new power is where renewables are actually quite good uh, and the developing world is you know does pretty well in terms of sun and it does pretty well often in wind. Uh, so, uh, you know, you would rather, if you had to generate your power via sun and wind, you'd rather be in most developing countries than you would in Finland, for example, especially if you were only dependent on sun. Um, so, <laughs> this, is, uh, this is different. Uh, how this fits into different development pathways, uh, I think it, it's something that, that we need to, to think about. Certainly for large dispersed economies like uh, you, you have in, in Africa, um, the, the, the availability of really quite low cost solar mini grids is, is potentially a, a, a huge gain. You're looking at uh, many, many regions, parts of Africa where you know, they, just, they, they don't have access to electricity and stringing wires all the way out there is gonna be um, quite, quite difficult. Uh, if you can get relatively low cost uh, uh, mini grid systems out there, then, then you, know, you, you can start to do a, a different kind of, of development uh, uh, paradigm. It does, you can't just dump mini grids out into the rural areas, right? I mean, if, you know, if I, you know, subsistence household just kind of living, uh, and you give me a mini grid, then you know, I, what am I going to do? I don't have, I, mean, I don't have a cell phone, I don't have a, <laughs> I don't pump, I don't have anything where I use the electricity. So that there's a, there's a whole integrated process that 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 needs to go on, and 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 I think that um, uh, it does fit quite nicely with what uh, Joe Stiglitz was was uh, uh, talking about. Um, so that I'll, I'll leave. Uh, I think I think I've done that on on the on the flooding point. Yes, natural flooding, you know, obviously. But what what we're talking about here is you know, repeated greater than fifty year events, right? Which which these are these are big, uh, or or up to up to a hundred. And uh, you know, if you're getting in, in the you know. 
what, what used to be a 50-year flood becomes a 10-year flood. That's a real change. Uh, and, and there's a lot of room for adaptation there uh, in terms of because a lot of the impact that we get is repeated washing out of infrastructure, especially road infrastructure, which in Africa is quite vulnerable as spaces are large. You generally don't have a lot of repetition of roads. You don't build two roads out. Uh, uh, so they're, they're, they're vulnerable to, to wash out. It costs a lot per kilometer to build those roads. And if you're out there repeatedly building them, repeatedly building, trying to re redo bridges, uh, it's, it's gonna cost you. Now, um, what needs to happen, and this is a you know, real conclusion coming out, is you need to build your roads a little bit higher up uh, so that you're, you're not as vulnerable uh, as, as, as you would be. Um, uh, so that, that's, and I think you know, people are, are starting to take that into account. Very small uh, addition. When we were talking about like uh, the question which Doug uh, uh, raised is that uh, when uh, uh, when Stiglitz was uh, saying, it was very interesting. He said that what we really need to look into is multiple sectors. And we need to address the multiple sectors simultaneously, how, how they, those can be addressed. And if you look into the SDG framework of till 2030, it actually gives you multiple entry points. So basically, when you are really looking into any of the mitigation option, we need not be thinking of only one mitigation option. Many model studies now show that you really need a portfolio approach. So how you combine them so that you get multiple benefits, and multiple benefits in terms of, say, just take the SDG framework now. So if you think in that way, then you can think in terms of your uh, short-term development pathways, which fits into the longer term. And so just not looking into the mitigation, but also the multiple benefits, and which can encourage the governments to uh, adopt multiple measures together. So I, I want to formally close this, but I'm going to ask Johannes one question, and then I'll stay here to talk about um, reservoirs and environmental impact. Within the Nile Basin Initiative, um, there are lots of reservoirs that are planned, um, and hydropower is an important part of the African Union's uh, Plan 2063 on Clean Power Initiative. Uh, what is the position on the on reservoirs within NBI and their environmental impacts? Surely with, uh, with large reservoirs, there's, there's, there's going to be a certain amount of both environmental uh, as well as uh, social, social impacts. But uh, uh, I am personally against you know, uh, this general idea of saying you know, large dams are bad. I could, take, uh, I could give you a case of the Grand Renaissance Dam in Ethiopia. Um, it's it's a large dam. It's 72 uh, billion meter cube of water, uh, and it comes at the border of Ethiopia. So if we look at the system, uh, just downstream of that, some further down, 20 kilometers, the Sudanese dams are going to come online, right? So this is not a natural system downstream. So when we are talking about the impact of Im environmental and social impact, we are we are talking about that 20 uh, kilometer stretch of uh, river segment that comes just downstream of Good River. So as we, if we compare this with the huge benefit that it's going to bring to the region and for the Ethiopia as well, uh, like I said, uh, primarily by providing the, uh, this cheap electricity, affordable electricity in the country, uh, where uh, electricity coverage is uh, only 30%, um, um, also, in terms of like in the future, we're we're if we're bringing more renewable resource into the system, like wind, hydro, we're definitely going to need some sort of battery system. So, and this uh, Grand Renaissance Dam is a huge opportunity for that. Currently, the capacity is 6,000 megawatt hour, but uh, the generation is going to be for base load. So, the load factor is around 30 percent. So, that uh, extra uh, 4,000 megawatt hours is there. And it's a huge opportunity in terms of serving as a power storage to modulate the system. So if we compare the, this additional huge benefit with that 20 kilometer stretch of environmental and the people that's going to be displaced uh, from, uh, from, that, uh, from the inundation at the back, I think uh, 
it's 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 un, unproportional. So I think the point I'm trying to make is uh, instead of you know generally banning these larger reservoirs, we have to look at every case uh, separately. Uh, and and one of the things that most donors are dealing with is trying to bring in safeguards so that we mitigate to the largest extent the impacts of those while getting the benefits. So I'd like you to join me in thanking our speakers for today.